Tribe and trust. Yes, easy, baba. Oh, yeah. Tribe and trust. These were the two themes in the last episode with filmmaker Andres J. Molina. Well, for me at least. It was apparent that they play a big role in the adjustment process. Not just for Jay, but in some way for us all. One, two, three, four. When I refer to tribe, I'm talking about a community of people that you identify with. Typically, this includes support, encouragement, collaboration. It's not about the number of people, but rather the quality of the relationships. Then there's trust. First, in yourself. As in having the courage and strength to live, speak, and move through life in your truth. Whatever that is. Whatever that is. Whatever that is. Then, trusting in others. Even if they're not a part of your tribe, which can test a person's ability to trust. Watch this, everybody. For this final self-portrait, I decided to sit with these things. Ask myself, how do these things fit into my life today? Today. Today. Going into this episode reminds me of how I used to feel when my girls were younger and they'd sit with me in the kitchen as I prepare a dinner every now and then. Oh my God. Baby girls, I say to them, I don't know how this is going to turn out, but I guess we'll see. And then one of my girls would say, Daddy, you're blind. You can't see. And then we just laugh. <laughs> Take a listen to the episode featuring my girls earlier this season, and you'll definitely get an understanding of our humor and communication style. I'm Thomas Reed, and you're now rocking with Read My Mind Radio. Let's go. That's bad. Read my mind. Read my mind. Radio. When I first got to the nursing home, I didn't know anybody, of course, so I was just hanging out by myself. One of the nurses told me, go outside. There's people just like you, young like you, and you can talk to them. But when I saw these guys, actually, one of them looked at Dominican, because I'm Dominican, that attracted me more. And as soon as I approached them, they just looked at me and said, yo, come on, man, you with us. I started hanging out with them, and that's why we became friends. I wasn't in any way alone during my early days of blindness. I had my family and some close friends. I even found another brother who I could speak with about this new experience we both shared. Yet when I heard Jay talk about meeting the other brothers outside the nursing home, it reminded me how I wanted more of that in my early days of blindness. Today, I believe what I wanted was acceptance and brotherhood. People in my life who really understood what I was now experiencing. My family and others were sympathetic, but sometimes you just want to be around those who you just know, get it? Details matter in relationships. When I asked Jay, for example, what was it about the group of guys hanging outside the nursing home that made him feel their words Come on, man, you with us. were true? He was quick to say they looked like him. They weren't doppelgangers. They just shared a culture and background, a style of dress, haircuts, or the way you wear your hat. It's recognizable. Let's go and stop, don't stop. PCP convention. PCP, PCP, PCP convention. I used to serve as the conference coordinator for the Pennsylvania Council of the Blind. During this one conference in Johnstown, Pennsylvania, a hotel employee asked me, Where you from? You're not from out here, he says. Are you from New York? That's all she wrote. He and I started talking, and as he noted, living out there in Johnstown, he was really homesick and didn't get the chance to just kick it with someone in that way. It's in the vibe. The way you say something, as in, it's in more than the words. It's understood. No explanations necessary. For the rest of that weekend, and even the next time we were in that hotel, if he saw me, he was going to stop and try to resume our conversation. I felt bad, because I was busy, and I just couldn't chat as much as I would have liked to. I, too, was missing that familiarity. I just wasn't in a position to kick it. But I appreciated him. There's something funny about being away from home and finding someone else from your town that makes you immediately bond with them. I'm sure this applies to others, but I can tell you there's definitely a New York thing that happens when we're out of town. I've been all sorts of places, thousands of miles away from home, and all of a sudden, you make eye contact with someone, and one of you immediately knows. You from New York, bro? I've met people who I believe if something broke out wherever we were at the time, they'd have my back, just on some we're both from New York type of thing. But if we were in New York, chances are 
we want to speak to one another. That's so funny, and yet awful and real. When you're new to disability, you can feel as if you're in a foreign land, right in your own neighborhood. The idea of recognizing home in someone is probably relatable to us all. And that space with the Pennsylvania Council of the Blind, it took some time to feel like a part of the group. But if I'm being honest, something was missing for me that could have made that feel more like my tribe. From the moment I attended my first conference, there were those in the group who weren't welcoming. That's to be expected. I don't think they liked me, my style, my ideas. The fact that I was rolling with a crew of people who were either new to blindness or new to the organized blind environment. We were also interested in having a good time and hyping ourselves up. Okay, I probably did a lot of the hyping up. (laughs) Most of the people seemed to enjoy and appreciate that, but there were definitely those who turned their noses up to that sort of thing. Even years later, after all of the work put into the organization, it just wasn't feeling like home. I chalked it up to not being from PA. Truth is, even though I lived here for over 20 years now, I just can't seem to claim it like that. I'm not PA. I'm always NYC. Now look, don't get me wrong. I truly love and deeply appreciate the people in PCB and what I was able to learn, both from them directly and through all of the interactions and experiences. Today, I'm older and still sort of feel a desire to find my tribe. But I now believe there's not one for me. Rather, there are multiple communities that fulfill me in different ways and at different times. A disability-centered space is something I find myself wanting to be around. Not all the time, but that free-flowing, accessible environment like we used to create with the PCB in-person conference is a great space to explore and feel what the world can be like with a bit of access. Access is just part of the story. If you're a person with multiple identities, inclusion means you're able to comfortably express your full self. You shouldn't have to deny some aspect of who you are in order to be accepted. For so long, there weren't many places outside of my home and among my family where I felt I can be my full self. That's not on anyone but me. There are people who I'm around today where I feel much more comfortable being myself. Some of that is because they're accepting. But a bigger part is me. I just care less today about what other people think. Maybe I'm just more comfortable with who I am as a person. This is definitely about blindness. By the time I became blind, I was quite secure with myself as a black man. But sometimes I still feel as though I'm in search of my tribe. The place I can bring my full self, my black, which includes my Puerto Rican, my blind, Bronx, my very silly and nerdy self. I've been promising my family that this is the year I grow up since forever. But forget that I'm staying five for as long as I'm alive. Is there a place that would welcome all of me? Unfortunately, organizations may think they're welcoming of everyone But individuals that make up the organization don't necessarily subscribe to that same idea. Even if they think they do, their actions aren't always in line with that philosophy. Everything is fine when it's obvious you're all headed to the same destination. You're on cruise control. Things seem to change, though, when you hit an intersection. And when that's at the corner of, let's say, blind and black, well... The degree of openness and brother and sisterhood gets tested. Welcoming, inclusion, diversity, all that stuff you said you are actually gets tested. If you are part of such an organization, look around. And if those who you met at the intersection are gone, well, you probably failed. Perhaps it's time to stop saying you're welcoming and actually become that. As disabled people, so much of our lives are impacted by access. The spaces we visit, the content and information we consume, the types of services we use, it all boils down to physical, digital, or some other form of accessibility. If I'm interested in participating in an event or getting involved with a non-blindness organization, I have to think about and plan around accessibility. I need to be prepared to spend time working through a website or app. 
ready to take a picture of a handout circulated during an event in order to have my phone read it. Ask for some sort of direction in a new physical space. Truth is, most organizations, like people, never consider accessibility. They never had to think about it. Similarly, organizations with very little or no participation of black people or others of color may not recognize the exclusion, or should we say (laughs) non-inclusion. The problem is, when any of these organizations say they are inclusive, but don't take any meaningful steps to actually change, therefore my black and or my blind aren't really welcomed. Is it really a community if my access needs aren't being met, but culturally, I'm included? Can I consider myself a part of a community when all of my access needs are met, but I have to leave my culture at the door? So it shouldn't be a surprise that this affects my participation. Or, is that what they wanted all along? Then they were never about community. Trust. I could imagine that some people found it strange when Jay mentioned that he and the other fellas didn't immediately trust Jenny Lee Brewster. If you recall, the group of brothers would gather outside the nursing home, smoke a little weed, you know, just chilling. And yes, at the time, weed wasn't legal in New York. And then we had this white woman coming around, asking questions. She was being really persistent. I won't beat around the bush here. These brothers most likely were concerned that Miss Brewster could be a Karen, a white lady, asserting her privilege and butting into the lives and business of others, especially people of color. You can find lots of examples of Karens at work on YouTube today, thanks to smartphones and the ease of recording. I'm in no way suggesting you go down that rabbit hole. It leads to all sorts of racist encounters that has an undercurrent of possible violence. Plus, watching mentally unstable people shouldn't be entertainment. For those who are actually named Karen, I feel for you. But you have nothing to worry about if you're not the type of person to racially profile people. There's no need to be offended if you're not the type of person to call the police on little black children selling lemonade outside their own home. For black people and others of color, these experiences aren't new at all. They're just documented now. Whether in corporate environments, schools, social settings, just about everywhere we exist, we learn to bob and weave, avoiding microaggressions like a boxer dodging jabs, uppercuts, and knockout blows. Actually, (laughs) everywhere we exist. Well, you the one talking about... I I, I think your fake eyelashes are messing up. No, ain't nothing. Hold on, hold on. So when Jay explained that he and the rest of the brothers who we become the reality poets were leery about letting Ms. Brewster into their circle, well, some of us can relate. Yet, we need each other. Jay's story reminds us of that. It's an example of how opportunity often doesn't present itself like we imagine it in our minds. It's not as defined. It's not flashy. The messenger rarely looks like the person we imagine or hope for. Trust is essential. Jay and the rest of the brothers eventually did put their trust in Miss Brewster. It paid off. They became the reality poets. That not only made an impact on them personally, but their art is doing the same for others. What if they didn't trust? What if they waited for an opportunity to present itself in a way that made them more comfortable? Did Jay's past make you uncomfortable? I'm talking about his former occupation. Drug dealer. He spent time in prison. I never asked about that part of his life. It's in his past. I do think about how many black and brown people today are behind bars for selling weed. Meanwhile, now legal in many states, the cannabis industry, overwhelmingly run by white men, has taken off. And like every other industry that forms, will be run by a few large corporations. I think about these black and brown men and women who, when released from prison, struggle to support themselves. This world doesn't really seem to hand out second chances very equitably. I don't want all of these microaggressions, systemic problems, the attacks on humanity to change me for the worse. I want to believe in people while still being aware. I want to be conscious and still able to trust in others. Hmm, that takes serious work.
When should we trust ourselves? We all have ideas that, at some given time, we believe are correct and defend. When something forces us to re-examine our perspective, we either realize our ignorance and change, or become even more convinced we're right. When Jay talked about his reaction to seeing a wheelchair user at the bus stop, knowing it was going to make him late for work, I'm sure he felt justified and would defend his position at that time. It's a common reaction in a busy town where everyone is rushing somewhere. We all want to hold someone responsible. You ever notice how no one gets mad at the bus designers? Why the heck didn't the bus manufacturers make it easier for those using wheelchairs to get on the bus like everyone else? We don't get mad at ourselves for not leaving earlier and building in time for unexpected delays. I give Jay a lot of credit for sharing that story. Anytime someone shares an ableist thought or action from their ableist past, I want to highlight it and recognize them for their honesty. I know it's not easy. I also think it's something we should uplift for the sake of making space for us all to grow. I want that space for me too. I've said and done things back in the day I wouldn't do today. I recognize and appreciate that Jay had to have a certain level of trust for me to share that story. In fact, I say that about all of those who share their stories with me on the podcast. I actually take that pretty seriously. Trust, in general, is a core value of mine. I don't do well with those who break it. Trust needs to be earned. Yet we really do trust in things that can't actually earn our trust. Wheelchairs, computers, access technology, a white cane. All of these things can't earn our trust. We're believing in those who make the equipment those who teach us how to use them, and mainly ourselves and our ability. When I once trained those new to blindness on technology, it was pretty obvious after a while who was going to adapt to the new way of getting things done. Some would focus on how they used to do it. I used to just click the mouse and drag this file over to the other window, they'd say. I'd say, yeah, I know. I did that too. But now let me show you how you can do this today. I hated my screen reader in the early days. I tried to convince myself that I couldn't understand what it was saying. But it was clear that the more I complained to myself, the less I was actually getting done. I didn't have an alternative. My eyes were gone, but my ears and ability to learn were all intact. So either I was going to quit and do nothing or figure it out. In my mind, the pain of quitting and doing nothing feels worse than trying and not getting it. At least you could keep trying. Then again, thinking about this now, of course I'd adapt to the technology. I've always been comfortable with tech. I'm confident in my abilities and I trust myself. In other areas of my life, I don't feel as confident and may not be as quick to adapt. Dang, I got to keep it real now. (laughs) There are times when it feels like I can't trust or believe in others, but perhaps I'm not really trusting in myself. My ego's telling me to strike this from the episode. We'll see who wins. There was a lot of trust involved in this art of adjustment season. I had no idea how I would produce the self-portrait episodes. I relied on inspiration and faith that something would come out of the conversations. That part, though, is a given. It's more about the trust than being able to make it work. Whether or not it works is subjective. That's up to you, the listener or transcript reader. My hope is that some concept or idea discussed in one of these AOA episodes got you thinking, perhaps encouraging you to consider how art or some form of expression can be a vehicle to assist you in your own adjustment. The focus here on RWM Radio is adjustment to disability, but it applies to life in general. I mean, y'all know that. You all make connections and don't experience things in a vacuum. That's why I enjoy hanging with y'all. Hmm. This is my tribe. The Read My Mind Radio family. This podcast has helped me meet and establish relationships with people I'd otherwise never really get the chance to interact with. We share similar perspectives on a variety of topics. At least we share the idea of being open. For me, that means open to other points of view, but not when they come at the expense of others or threaten a group's existence. I'll remain close to hate, lies, and deception. That's some corny sucker stuff. 
Even though this is a podcast and the communication seems like it only flows in one direction, you know it doesn't have to always be like that, right? You can hit me up. Read my mind radio at gmail.com. Give it a try. R E I D. Mm, how do you spell it? R E I D M. Okay. R E I R E I D M Y M I N D R A D I O. No spaces. It's all right there. Read my mind radio at gmail.com. How is art or some other form of expression a part of your adjustment? Have you been delaying a pursuit of an interest? Did any particular story resonate with you in a special way? Let a brother know. If you didn't really dig these series of episodes, like it wasn't your thing, you could blame that on me. Well, you're probably not listening right now, so I'll move on. If you enjoyed these episodes, well, give the credit to the artists themselves. Crystal, Andrew, Kiana, and Jay. It's all their fault. They not only shared their stories and perspectives, but they inspired the thoughts and ideas that came to be the self-portrait episodes. That inspiration, though, is a result of our actual conversations, their work, interests, and experiences. I hope it proved to do the same for you. The process of producing it alone, in my mind, is the win for me. Like I said earlier, I don't know how this is going to turn out, but I guess we'll see. <laughs> I'm off to continue working on the next season. That means you won't hear from me until July or August. There's a lot going on. We do have a Blind Centered Audio Description Chat episode dropping in June, so stay tuned for that. Also, if you're interested in some free audio described content, head on over to ReadMyMind.com. I'll link you to a YouTube playlist of the 2024 Easter Seals Disability Film Challenge finalists. Audio description provided by Social Audio Description Collective. (laughs) The best way to stay informed is to follow or subscribe to Read My Mind Radio wherever you get podcasts. Transcripts and more at readmymind.com. There's lots of ways to get there. Maybe you open your favorite browser and type. Some of y'all like to dictate however you do it you got to spell it right say it with me that's R come on this could be a lot of fun do it that's R to the E I D D and that's me in a place to be like my last name Peace.